In Unified Network Controller, if you go to the network configurations in this setting, you can configure the device isolation. We all know if we want to control the access between VLANs, we may go to firewall rules and configure corresponding rules. If we simply want to isolate the networks, we can use the layer 3 switch, the ACL functionality, right? But what if we want to isolate the devices within one VLAN. You cannot rely on firewall rules anymore because your network traffic won't go through the router. You have to rely on ACL, more specifically MAC ACL. This is my simple lab environment. I have a UX3 Pro as the router and a Cloud Key Plus to run the network controller. I have two layer three unified switches. For this video, I'm going to run multiple devices. They belong to different VLANs. I'm going to discuss from backend perspective how the Mac ACL works once you configure the device isolation. Then we will check whether the device isolation works for the VLAN which you configured in your layer 3 switch instead of using your router. When we have multiple switches, whether the device isolation still works for a given VLAN. Later, we will talk about what if you use PFSense or you host your network controller using your own computer, whether the device isolation still works. In the end, we will briefly discuss after you enable the device isolation, whether the MDNS services still work within a given VLAN. Okay, let's get started. By the way, from the wording of the setting, it's device isolation, which means the granularity is on the VLAN level. Either your devices are completely isolated or they are able to access each other. If you want to achieve finer granularity, for example, within one VLAN, whether whether one device can access the other device, you have to rely on menu backend command lines. I did have a video posted. If you are interested, you can take a look. Let's start with a very simple scenario. You can see in the network controller setting for VLAN 10, the router is UXG Pro. So it is not a layer 3 switch VLAN. It's a regular VLAN, right? And then in the lower part of the screen, you can see two Linux devices. They both belong to VLAN 10. Then let me get their IP addresses. From device 1, let me ping device 2. Okay, it's pingable, right? We haven't enabled the device isolation for VLAN 10 yet. Now let me go to the network setting, enable the device isolation. Let me choose VLAN 10 only, apply changes. Now let me ping the device 2 from device 1 again. Okay, it's not reachable anymore. So the device isolation is effective. Let's go to the switch backend to see what really happened behind the screen. Let me SSH into the unified switch. Telnet to itself. EN for enabling. Config. Okay, then let me run a command to show the current MAC ACL. The command is show MAC access lists. As you know, there are two types of ACL in backend, IP ACL and MAC ACL. This video is about the MAC ACL. There's only one access list called global MAC ACL, and you can see there are seven rules in it already. The ACL applies to all the interfaces for the switch. Let's see what's inside the ACL. What are the seven rules? The same command, but followed by the ACL name. Let's examine the seven rules one by one. The way ACL rules work is similar to firewall rules, so the system will execute them in a sequential way. If any rule meets the condition, the rules remaining won't be executed. So let's start from the top one. The action permit is allowed because it's MAC ACL. It need to indicate the MAC addresses. So you either indicate destination or source or both. The first rule is only about the destination limitation. It permit 
if the destination is this one. What's this one? In the network controller, let me go to devices, enable the MAC addresses column. As you can see, the MAC address in the first rule is about the cloud key. The device is allowed to access the cloud key. That makes sense, right? You use cloud key to manage the network, so your device need to be able to communicate with the cloud key. And then the second rule is similar. It's also about the cloud key, but this time the direction is the other way. The source is cloud key, which means it allows the cloud key to access your device. The first two rules are very simple. The third rule is also a permit rule, MAC address is this one. If you compare it with the unified controller device MAC addresses, you can see it's very similar to the router, to the UXG Pro, but it's just the very last digit is different. Why is that? Let me show you. Let me SSH into the router. Remember in the left side, we SSH into the switch, not the router. Okay, then run the Linux command, IP link. It lists all the links from the operating system perspective. So see the very last several of them. Ethernet 3 is for the LAN part. I connect the network with dot 10 means for VLAN 10. In this scenario, we enabled the device isolation for VLAN 10. So then let's check the MAC address for this particular interface for VLAN 10. See it's here. It's exactly the same one listed in the ACL rule. Basically, the third rule in the ACL says it permits my devices in VLAN 10 to communicate with the destination if its MAC address is the LAN part of the router for VLAN 10, right? That makes sense. Of course, you should allow your client device to communicate with the router. You may be curious, then what's the MAC address listed on the unified controller, the one ending with 69, right? In fact, it's the MAC address for Ethernet zero part, the one part. So we understand what's the third one, and the fourth one is the same MAC address, it's for the router, but this time it's about source MAC address. Just like the cloud key, the third and the fourth rules, they are about the router. In the diagram for these four green lines, the ACL permits the communications between my client device and the cloud key plus and the router. Even though you didn't set on the UI in the backend, the system automatically allowed the communications to the network controller and to the router. Okay, move on to the next one. The next rule, there's a interesting new line. It's about the VLAN. See this even more interesting MAC address is RF. This MAC address means it's a broadcast address. Your device can send something to the broadcast address. You may wonder what is this rule for? For. Why my device needs to send something to the broadcast address? I want complete device isolation for my VLAN 10, right? Let me show you one example. For this VLAN 10 Linux device to even communicate with the router, it needs to know the router's IP address, right? To make the network communication possible, it also needs to know the MAC address for that IP address. To get the MAC address mapping, the device needs to maintain the ARP table. Let me show the ARP table current content. It only has one entry and it is for the router. Before doing anything, let me launch Wireshark start capturing the Ethernet part. You can see I already filtered the display using ARP protocol. Here in the terminal, let me delete the existing ARP entry. Delete this one to force the ARP table to be refreshed. Let's try to ping the router. Okay, see, it's already captured something, right? You can see the first frame is from this Linux machine sent to broadcast destination. If we check the Ethernet details for destination, you can see the MAC address or F, right? Just like what we see in the left side in the ACL rule. Next frame, unified router directly replied back. In this simple two frame example, we already used two MAC ACL rules. The first one, we permit the Linux device to send 
packet to the broadcast address. The second frame, we permit the router to send packet to the Linux device. Even though we enabled the device isolation for VLAN 10, the Linux device can still get the MAC address for the router or for whatever IP address it's allowed to access. So there are two more rules. This one is for VLAN 10 and the action is very simple, deny. It's represented using these two red lines. That's what isolation means. And the very last one is very simple, permit action. Match all is true for all the other traffics which are not covered by the preceding rules. They are all allowed. So which is shown here. Move on to next scenario. We just talked about regular VLAN, right? Now now let's see whether the device isolation works for the VLAN, which is only maintained by layer 3 unified switch. Here in the unified network controller for VLAN 88, you can see the router is the switch, not the UXG Pro. It's only available on switch level for inter VLAN routing. And let's see whether we can enable the device isolation for VLAN 88. Deselect VLAN 10. Yes, we do have VLAN. 88 listed here. The system doesn't differentiate the two types of VLANs at all when you enable device isolation. Go to the backend to see what the access list looks like. So see, we have the same rules for cloud key for router. This time we have a new MAC address. Let's see what's this MAC address for. I just launched another SSH session to the switch. Let me run IP link. As you can see, the very last one, this MAC address matches what we have in the ACL. So from the name, you can see this is for the inter VLAN routing functionality within the switch. The system added this new rule for the same reason as we have the rules for unified router for USG Pro, right? We have a VLAN managed by the switch. So that's why we have this entry. Then let's see what else. We have the other one for the other direction for the switch routing. The only new rules are these two, which are related to the VLAN 88 routing functionality of the switch. Okay, so this scenario is very simple. Let's move on. We just talked about the scenarios where you only have one unified switch. But what if you have multiple? In this lab environment, as you can see, I have two unified switches. I have a VLAN, which is managed by the router, not by switch. In each switch, I have a device connected. Whether I can achieve the isolation for the devices cross switches. Let's try that. So in the unified network controller, go to device isolation remove 88 add VLAN 10, apply changes. And in the lower part of the screen, you can see two sessions. Left one is still connected to the first unified switch. And in the right one, let me SSH into the second switch. Okay, I'm in. By the way, this switch is enterprise product line, but because it's not rack mount, it has a little bit simplified command line. It doesn't work in the exact same way as the rack mount switch, but very very similar. So let me run show access list. And then in the left part, let me run the command again just to show the updated access list. We enabled device isolation for VLAN 10 on the system level. So we expect to see corresponding access rules in two different switches, right? Let's check the left side one. The left side switch has the exact same rules as the first scenario we tried when we only have one unified switch. Then let's see what the situation in the second switch. So the first rule, the source is NA and the destination is the cloud key. The second rule, source is the cloud key. The destination is NA. And the third one is for the unified router. And the fourth one for the router, the other direction. And then we have the forecast rule. And then we have the NA to NA deny rule for VLAN 10. By the way, for this switch, it doesn't 
have the very last permit or rule listed out, but internally it does follow the same way. So if we compare the left and the right side access rules, they are the same. We already have the question answered. Even if you have multiple unified switches, when you enable the device isolation cross switches, they still work. We can easily validate it. So in the two Linux machines, the right side one is connected to the second unified switch. Let me ping the left side Linux device. No, it's not pingable. In unified network controller, if we disable the device isolation, then let me ping the first Linux device again. Yeah, it's successful. We have two unified switches. The device isolation still works. Move on to next scenario. In fact, this is for two different scenarios. What if for router, you use third party ones, for example, PFSense. And then what if for network controller, you don't have a cloud key, you don't have a unified console, which has the unified network controller built in, you have to self host a network server in that scenario, whether you can still enable the device isolation. Let's look into them one by one. First, what if you use PFSense? In the right side network controller, I only have two unified devices, a cloud key, which is running the network controller, a unified switch. You don't see any router because the router is PFSense. You can see I have VLAN 1, 10, 20. They are managed by third party gateway, meaning PFSense in my case. I also have VLAN 66 and 88. They are managed by the unified layer 3 switch. So I have two types of VLANs when I use PFSense. If we go to the device isolation, you can only see VLAN 66 and 88. They are managed by unified switches. You may wonder why you don't see the other VLANs, let's say VLAN 10 or 20, right? This is related to what we discussed in the very beginning. See this diagram? In the access list, the system need to generate multiple rules. Some of them are related to the device that you run the network controller and the device you use as router. But if you use PFSense, this router information is missing from the network controller. So yes, in your mind, you know everything about your PFSense, right? But the network controller doesn't know, which means network controller cannot generate some access list which meet your environment. That's why the system will not enable the device isolation for the VLANs which are managed by PFSense. But it doesn't mean technically it won't work because access list is access list. As long as you simulate the unified router way just to replace the MAC address with your PFSense information, the same access list still work with PFSense, right? But you have to do it by yourself. Okay, so this is the case for PFSense. What if you don't use cloud key, you use a self hosted network controller? Okay, in this environment, I have a very old unified router, USG Pro, and I self-host the network controller using a Linux machine. You can see the network server is in the latest version. If I go to network, I have a VLAN defined, managed by the unified router. Then if I go to device isolation, I am able to select VLAN 10. But you can see the default network is disabled and you can tell from the tour tip the reason is the network application is running on VLAN default because we are running the self-hosted network controller and the network controller is running in VLAN default. So let me go to the original lab environment where we use Cloud Key and UXG Pro. If I go to the device isolation. As you can see, I am able to select default. So this is the difference between self-hosted network controller and the cloud key or you have network controller running on, let's say, UDM Pro. I really do not have explanation about why if you use cloud key, you are able to do device isolation in default network. If you know, please put in the comments.
The very last scenario for this video is about MDNS. In fact, we already know the answer. Of course, if I have a Apple machine and a Apple TV, if I enable the device isolation, they shouldn't be able to see each other, right? I just want to briefly validate it. In the lower right part of the screen, I have a Mac mini. At this moment, from the network controller, you can see I don't have the device isolation enabled because the Mac mini and the Apple TV, they are in the same VLAN. It doesn't matter whether I enable the MDNS in network controller or not. It's not relevant. I should be able to see the Apple TV from Mac mini, right? Let's validate it. Screen mirroring. Yes, I see the Apple TV. Now let me enable the device isolation for VLAN 20. Okay, enabled. Then in the Mac Mini, let me run Wireshark to see what will happen when it comes to MDNS. Start capturing. I already enabled the MDNS display filter. Now let me do the same thing again. Okay, so here there are several things going on. In the drop down menu, you still see Apple TV, but if you really click on it, it will wait, 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 and then it will report an error. Why? You see this Apple TV just because it's a cached entry. So if you wait longer enough, it should disappear automatically, right? It doesn't matter. Let's look into the network frames we captured. You can see the Mac mini tried several times, send the query to the same destination IP address, the multicast IP address, but it didn't receive any answer from anyone. That's the effect of device isolation we enabled in network controller, right? If we check a detailed frame, for example, the first one for the destination, you can see the MAC address is not the RF MAC address. Don't confuse the multicast packet with the broadcast ACL rule we mentioned earlier. This MDNS has nothing to do with the broadcast ACL rule. We just validated two different things. First, the MDNS query won't get answer back because even the query itself is not allowed by the access control list. So the query won't even reach the multicast IP address. The second thing is even if you have the cached entry, for example, in the screen mirroring, it doesn't matter. Even if you try, you will get error back. Your device is isolated from the Apple TV. Okay, this ends the video. Thanks for watching.